Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm your co-host, Mia Rajo, and I'm joined today by the wonderful Lauren Brown and the amazing Eric Wilkerson. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to talk today actually about uh, excellence versus perfectionism. Perfectionism. Sorry, I just like, is that a word? (laughs) It is a word. Perfectionism is absolutely. It is a word. (laughs) I just want to make sure it's not a weird because I always say perfectionist, but yeah, I'm a perfectionist and I'm sure, I'm sure you guys are too. I'm sure a lot of artists are. Um, And actually that's what got me thinking about this topic that um, I think excellence is like pursuing excellence is like the positive side of being a perfectionist is what you, it's what you think you're doing when you're being a perfectionist. But the more I thought about this, the more I feel like a lot of the negative aspects of being an artist are kind of fueled by being a perfectionist. So I kind of wanted to chat about that with you guys and and uh, see how, if it affects you in the same way and, and all that good stuff. So uh, Lauren, let's start with you. Do you oh, consider boy. yourself a, a perfectionist? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I have gotten a little bit better about this, but still um, not, at, I, don't, I still scrutinize a lot of my stuff uh, pretty intensely when I create it. And, um, and I feel it hardcore after I create a piece, mm-hmm. even if I feel okay, when I finish something, I look at it later and I'm like, mm, I don't know, maybe I could have done X, Y, and Z thing, or maybe I could have blah, blah, blah especially if it's going to have a lot of eyes on it, something that's like a little bit more high profile or something that I'm selling. I'm just like, I look at it and I'm like, I don't know if I, maybe I could have done a better job. And I, I start picking it apart. Um, And what I think I'm doing is that I'm making it better, but usually the things that I'm looking at are things that no one in the world is going to notice, but me. Mm -hmm. And it's the source of a lot of anxiety. And, um, and it makes me feel like, I'm not doing a good enough job or I'm not like uh, trying hard enough. But in reality, I know that, um, you know, it is just perfectionism that is causing me to overanalyze everything that I create, that I'm creating. Um, And so I'm trying to actively get better about that, um, not just as an artist, but also as a person who has to manage other people and has, and has to be an art director. But I can talk about that bit a little bit later because I'm curious about how Eric approaches this topic too. Well, um, I actually came prepared with some notes this time rather than just like blathering something off the top of my head. Um, And that's fine too, by the way. (laughs) But you wrote anything down. Now I feel bad for not ever doing that. No, no. But no, but it's 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 fine. I mean, I I I, anyway. Um, I I consider myself. I don't know if I consider myself a perfectionist because I know that I have a deadline to hit. Mm. So I do what I know I'm capable of doing within a time frame. And once the job is approved, I don't look at the piece again. I don't, I don't go, you know what? I could glaze something over this real quick, or I could tint this or add an adjustment layer or do this or that it's done. And I I tell my students, like, are you an, I ask my students, are you an illustrator or are you a fine artist? Because if you're a fine artist, you could work on a piece for months, years. You can be a perfectionist. You can sit there and render the crap out of everything in that piece or make everything a blur except for one head in the foreground. And it could take you years. Because that perfectionism leads to like, it creates indecisiveness Mm -hmm. and anxiety because nobody is ever telling you to stop. It's okay, put the brush down. It's a masterpiece, it's good, right? Um, Would we have the Sistine Chapel, the Sistine ceiling if, you know, Michelangelo wasn't a perfectionist? Would we have some of, uh, you know, Alphonse Mucha's works the, those like Slavic epic paintings. You know what I'm talking about? Those giant yeah. ass paintings. Slavic epics are incredible. Right, they're incredible. But do you think anybody was like, all right, it's done. <laughs> like, I mean, go one sit of them down. Had like really <laughs> unfinished figures in the back. And so clearly it was <laughs> like he had to put two parts of it. Was that, <laughs> was it unfinished or was it intentional? Ooh. Yeah. But how do you make right? the difference? It still looked finished to me, but you go up and you're like, oh, cool, it's this process. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you get to right. see the strokes and everything. So, yeah. 
<laughs> um, what I what I had written down was that your imperfections over time become your style. Mm -hmm. And if you are so consumed by making sure every brushstroke, every shape, every color, every value is perfect, you're never going to complete a, uh, you're never going to complete it. You're never going to complete the job. You're never going to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I know artists personally that it takes them a year or more to paint a single piece. I'm like, what, what are you doing? It, <laughs> painting a leaf doesn't take that long. Like why? <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm sitting here going like I haven't finished a painting this year but that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> but I say I, I tell my students set a timer for yourself mm -hmm. 20 minutes 30 minutes an hour that face only gets an hour that arm only gets 20 minutes that ear 20 minutes that's good whatever job. it whatever it looks like at the end of that timer when that timer goes off that's where you're that's where it's at that's it's done mm -hmm. you have to move on Nick, Nick, because you you have a, you have to hit a deadline yeah so i that for me i can go back i can unless they ask for revisions like i'm i'm, I'm doing revisions on a piece right now and they asked for some light changes and i'm like all right well this gives me <laughs> an excuse to go back in and touch up some other stuff but if they had just said perfect send your invoice i'm like all right done this would have just gone on a shelf yeah until it was time to reveal the painting but i don't know that's uh that's my view on it i can i can i can strive for excellence mm -hmm. within a time frame i strive for i'm not a perfectionist i strive for excellence within a time frame that's me that's actually a good distinction because that literally is what this topic is about that it's like you are you can still appreciate your own work even though in your head you're like I know I can do better if I had more time for instance or whatever but that doesn't bother you and I think the difference between someone who strives for excellence is somebody who is like I'm going to strive for my best with each piece and strive to get better and to keep learning and to keep evolving and I think we should all strive for that to the best of our ability to you know in terms of the time we have in terms of our work-life balance our family's you know dynamics all that kind of stuff but I think the difference with a perfectionist is someone who and I can say this from experience is like I don't let myself be satisfied with something if I see the gaps in my knowledge if I see the flaws and it's and that's the problem. That's where it becomes toxic because it doesn't matter whether I did my best, whether I did good work. If I see flaws, then I, I can't be happy. And it's almost like dangling a carrot in your life where you're just like, when I'm the most, you know, blank, then I can be happy. But until then, I'm going to be stressed and worried and anxious and X, Y, Z, you know, and uh and I don't think that helps anyone, you know, it's like you are, you need to find your value and your worth as an artist every step of the way in the process, you know, because it's a long road. And if you're waiting to be satisfied with your work to when you're, you're like at this level of mastery or perfection, then it's, it's unattainable. Like you're never going to get there and you're just gonna be miserable. So. <laughs> so you, you look at your work and you're, you're, you're not happy with it and you're, but are you comparing yourself to others or you just you see the imperfections what what goes through your mind when you when when that happens so like for a deadline I just finished I'm like really proud that I made the deadline and I'm like I made it happen and I finished it and that lasts for like a little bit and then what takes over is like here's all the things I could have done to make this better you know, and it's, and then that kind of drives me nuts because I'm like, they're going to think that I thought that was the best I could do when in my head, I'm like, I see all the flaws, meaning I know I could have done better, but, but what you're saying, Eric is like, that's the best I could have done in that time frame, And that's enough. And actually, and what you were saying, Lauren, too, is like, most people will not be nitpicking your work the way that you do, because you've been staring at it for months or weeks or whatever. And so I think it's a combination of both those things where uh, I've obviously gotten to a point with this piece where now the flaws that I see are beyond, you know, the point that I am at now, but I had to get here first to then see those flaws, you know, and so I'm not yeah. appreciating where I'm at. I'm not pausing to look at the view and be like, look how beautiful this view is. 
in this hiking metaphor, <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> here's that mountain I still haven't climbed and damn it, not enough. You know, it's like not enough. That's, that's the, that's how I see it. It's not that I think my work is trash. It's not that I think my work is horrible. It's that I think it's never enough, no matter how good I do. Mm. And that's the thing that's torturous, you know? <laughs> well, there's the opposite end of that. Like you, 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 you're, you beat yourself up over, over your stuff, not feeling you, over you not feeling like your stuff is good enough within that time frame, And then I've met artists who know that their stuff is good enough and don't feel like they've been given enough time to mm. complete, to give their best. Mm -hmm. Then that's the other side of that perfectionist mentality. Like, well, I'm going to do it. I'm mm. going to do it on my time. Mm -hmm. Like screw your deadline. Right. Mm. And I've, I've, I, I've met uh, a sci-fi fantasy illustrator who no longer does it that burned himself out of the industry. Oh. He was doing amazing book covers. Like if he was still doing it, he'd, he'd be at the top of his game, award-winning, blah, 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 mm. you know, killing it. But he was killing it back in the nineties. And you're like, oh my God, like this is, I, I don't, I couldn't believe some of these things were paintings. Mm. Right. But he was he was blowing through deadlines like no i'm not going to turn that in yet because it's not finished it's not to my quality not to my oh, wow. you know expectation of quality or you know and jobs would just li line his walls either like 99% finished <laughs> or or he putting in details that nobody would ever see except for him mm -hmm. right I'm putting in this, these little pores or these little details in the windows of the spaceships in yeah. the background because I know they're there, not because they're going to reproduce, but yeah. he would put in that kind of time. And then eventually people just stop calling it. <laughs> so like, <laughs> as, right, you gotta, you, you have, there has to be a cutoff point. Oh yeah, it is really, it's really important to know when to call it quits and when to say, okay, like I have to hang this up no matter what, because I do have a deadline I need to meet. And I, I do have to, you know, have to adhere to that because I'm working for a client. But, um, but my personal perfectionism doesn't actually uh, regard that client work because I know I can't be a perfectionist with a lot of that stuff just because I don't have the time to do it. Especially when it's something like Deck of Wonders where it's like literally 52 illustrations. They're not going to be the most amazing version of the illustrations that I can do. And I had to live with that. But I'm also like looking at it and like, oh man, like I know this isn't like my, you know, like some of these cards aren't my best work, but like amongst 52, you can't make your best work amongst all 52 cards. Like within a deadline, there's just no way you can do that. But, um, but I almost don't want to look at it again, just because I'm just like, oh no, like all of my friends will see, like not my best work, but I'm like, it can't matter. Like there's no way I could have done my best work with those constraints on me. And I have to be okay with that and have to live with that. But I'm realizing that my perfectionism actually comes in, not just my art, but also just with things that I'm doing that I want to do well. Uh, for example, if I've done a presentation or if I've, you know, like running things at work or if I'm like, you know, doing something um, at a show or if I have to be on in some kind of way, I always think afterwards and pick apart my performance or pick apart what I could have done better. And I'm like, oh, like, I wish I had done this and that. But yeah, again, it's like, I also need to adopt that healthy mentality. That's like, I just want to do excellence with what I can do, like what my level of capability and it has to be okay, but um, but it will give you anxiety to to always want to be perfect. But it's really really hard to not want that perfection. <laughs> but there's also no such thing. Like, what does that even mean? Like, what does perfection mean for like each person? Like, I because like it's a moving target always. Oh, yeah. So I think we make it very unfair for ourselves. Like, what are we chasing? Well, for me, it was comparing myself to the top people in the industry mm. when I was in college saying okay well um like who are the top award-winning people mm -hmm. like you you find out who the best is study the best you don't want to study the <laughs> the, the the guy that's only getting three hundred dollars mm -hmm. an image mm -hmm. right uh <laughs> find out who the top of the who the person at the top of their game is figure out what it is that they do, why they, why they are so successful and 
Now, but could a comic book artist do that? Like you couldn't, you you couldn't throw a stone. How is it? What is that saying? Throw you can't throw a stone. I don't know, far enough. Land. Anyway, but you know how many people were out there trying to copy oh. Jim Lee and all those image yeah, guys, yeah. like the clones that came out of the '90s into the early 2000s. There's still a lot of clones on social media, still, like people yeah, that just need want to ape how someone else draws so bad. Right, that's right. Their idol, you know. And that's that's what that's what they think gets them work, or that's what they think people want to see. Yeah. Um, but they're still learning. Yeah. And I mean, they're always going to be learning. I'm still learning. But at some point, they stop trying to, I don't want to say surpass, but they stop trying to find their own way. And they just settle into, I want to be the perfect copy Hmm. or as good as I can be of such and such a person. So like looking at different artists coming up through the seventies, how many people were trying to ape Frank Frazetta, Mm -hmm. you know, and like, I'm going to do a polished version of Frank Frazetta. Well, I'm going to copy the person that's doing the polished version of Frank Frazetta and so on and so on and so on. (laughs) It's, it's just an interesting thing, but um, I I spent a lot of time like looking at comic book artists and, 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 and other illustrators and saying, okay, well, here's their recipe. Like, I, uh, this is what I guess works. So I need to perfect that. Hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, I, don't know, I mean, that's, that's all, that's all par for the course though. That's always been the art world, like always been the art world. Like, yeah. you know, like back in the Renaissance, back at like, you know, and like when illustration was really rising up in the 19, you know, early 1900s and like all those, all those illustrators were just being taught by each other. And so their styles looked so very similar to each other because they were just learning from each other. So it was just, it looked like a clone, but then they would add their own unique twist to that thing. And then they would make it, you know, they had one thing that that was their signature and then somebody else built on that and that was their signature. So that's nothing new. But it's, you know, it's that level of perfection within what you can bring to it. I think that's, that can be the difficulty there. Um, because like, I, I know for me, I can't really emulate anybody directly because I just can't do that. Like, I know that I want to create something that is unique to me, but for me, my perfectionism is trying to top what the last thing I created was, yeah. or trying to make sure that it resonates with people as deeply as the last piece did. Um, and so if I can't do that, then I feel like, I'm like, oh, like I got to try again. This, is, this didn't work. But I also, I can't really speak right now because I don't have, um, I haven't really been making my own art in a while. Like I've been t- kind of taking a break from my own art to recharge my batteries. But Mia, like, what does that perfectionism really look like for you? Like was- why? Like, what are you chasing? I mean, I think it's just, it's almost like my head is ahead of my hands. And and I think that's true for every artist. It will always be. And actually I think it was Carla Ortiz that said this where she was saying uh, like your head will always be like, and I, what I mean by your head is like your mind's understanding yeah. of, of art, of, of like composition and all these things is like almost five years ahead of what your hand can actually do. And the more things, the more classes, more tutorials you watch, you're kind of like speeding your mind up, but you're not actually, if you're not actually doing exercises, you're not helping that gap. You're just, because we're all with social media and the internet at our fingertips, all this information is right there. And so you can cram your head with knowledge, but if you don't actually practice it with your hand, you're actually not making it any better. And that frustration, I think, is what I'm chasing, where it's like, there's certain concepts that I understand that I don't, when I look at my work, I'm like, it doesn't look like I understand those things, but because I can critique my own art with those things in mind, I feel like I understand them, but I haven't had enough Some of it's been time, you know, because I was serving for so many years that I physically did not have time to paint and draw as much as I wanted, you know, or now that I'm shifting over to writing, I know I can't spend as much time on the certain skills that I want to get better at. And so it's that frustration as well, that it's like, I have to split my attention in different ways. And anytime you do that, you're just more, you know, cognizant of the amount of time that you're not getting to to practice the skill that um, that my, my, again, that my head gets, but my hand hasn't figured out how to do. So I think that's kind of it in a nutshell, but honestly, it kind of goes back to like, my parents were super hardworking and, and I think they really instilled that sense of excellence in me of like, always do your best over, always give 110%, take pride in the work you do. 
in every aspect of your life. And I, I really internalized that as a kid, but I think even as an adult, it's something I still live by, but they're uh, also very judgmental. And so they're, you know, they're, it's funny because a lot of my immigrant friends feel the same way where it's like, if you came from like a judgmental background, like you kind of internalize that too. And you, you're really hard on yourself in, in ways that you're not hard on your friends or your loved ones, you know? And so I think, I think it's just an aspect of just being really hard on myself and expecting more from myself, even though I know I work hard and I know I do my best and I, and I should be satisfied with that. It's like, and maybe some of that's, you know, being a woman in the world as well, you know, like we're kind of always presented with a perfect image, you know, that we can never attain. And, and, and there's this always the sense of no matter how hard I work, I will not get paid as much. I will not be considered smart as smart as, you know, all these things. <laughs> and so I think it's a combination of things of where it comes from for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's sad because I feel like one part of my brain gets it like that I should be, I am happy with where I am right now. And I understand that it's a long process and imperfection sounds better to me than perfection because perfection sounds kind of scary. Actually, it sounds like a robot, yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> a polished kind of like chrome piece of something that is yeah. unattainable. Like someone who's perfect at everything, I would find that terrifying. And yeah, like, I, why, I think why would I want to be like that? <laughs> it's <was> scary. <laughs> well, it's even it's annoying when they know that they're. Oh yeah. And they're just conceited about it. <laughs> yeah. Know? Why would you want to be like that? <laughs> I've had instructors that you know you you compliment their work and they're like, yeah, I know. Oh yeah. And they're like, whoa, <laughs> dude. Now. Like, I'm oh, now. Like, settle down i mean it's okay to know your own skill level in a pool of people but still like be chill about it like, just chill a little bit or, or or have somebody go like well i appreciate your honesty right like oh my god yeah no, i don't think i want to be that like i think in, in a certain aspect i like some of my imperfections like i like that um you know like people were like oh like i felt like your work was like blah 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 but now i see that that was like a reason like you're trying to convey something which, which is the reason why you keep your values like you know in this range or the, why you use these colors and I'm just like okay so like my imperfections do actually say something so it's like basically about how do you use them to your advantage yeah. um because I think we can definitely turn it around and make it something that could be instead of like aiming for like what's the perfect piece like how do I make myself and like my flaws actually stand out as something that is a benefit to me um, and that's something that I've been thinking a lot about while not doing my own art <laughs> in recent years, <laughs> because, um, because I've gotten a chance to kind of step away, I've gotten to think about that instead. So um, I did like a post on Facebook a few months ago, just asking like, what was it about my art that stood out to people? And it was like, the response I got was like crazy. And I didn't even expect most of it, but it was really helping me understand that these things that I subconsciously think about that, you know, like, here's a mood that I think is cool. I don't know how other people perceive it, um, but people have perceived it in a positive way. And I was like, oh, like if I had tried to attain this invisible level of perfection that would have smoothed out these flaws in my art, they would have never gotten that message from it. Mm -hmm. And like my, you know, like what I'm trying to communicate would have never come across to that. So I think that perfectionism can kind of hurt us in a way. Oh, yeah. because it it polishes out all the rough edges but the rough edges are what makes us who we are and what makes us the artists that we are so mm -hmm. like I'm curious as to like what your rough edges are that you kind of like are okay with or like having those rough edges it doesn't have to be like about a painting itself but it can be about just like you or your career or whatever it is that makes you you yeah because yeah I think it's special I don't know <laughs> I, I think that's the stuff that makes people interesting I like the messiness I like I like flawed characters and stories, you know? So it's like all of that would make sense that I would like in perfection in, in real life. But again, I feel like it's a, it's a sense, it's a, it's like being demanding of myself uh, that, that it comes from, but in other people, I don't feel that way, you know? In other people, I can appreciate all the, all the flaws. And in fact, actually, this is one thing I want to say. If I see someone struggling at their art, but they they still do good work. I actually admire them more than if yeah. I see them not struggle and just seem like it's effortless. To me, I can't connect with that. I'm like, that's like God level shit, which some people, I used to as a young person, like be like in awe of someone that's almost like God level like that, where they don't show any kind of, 
human frailty, you know, but for me now, I actually get more emo emotionally connected to somebody who I see struggling or admit that they're struggling and then still do fucking kick-ass work. Excuse my language, but yeah. <laughs> well, like struggle? struggling how? Struggling with the creation of the art or struggling with everything else around the creation of the art? Any of it, because, and however they want to communicate it, because I think I also came up during a time where you were supposed to kind of guard the mystique of how art is created for the lay yeah. people, right? And so, and, and it's supposed to look like a magic act. Like, look how easy it is for me. Look how magical this is. But if you, if you were to say, I actually drew this head 10 times before arriving at this one, and it was trash every single time. I would respect that last 10th head and like, oh my gosh, this took 10 times to get there. I think that's awesome. Whereas in the past, I would have been like, oh, it took you 10 times. You're not very good then, are you? You know, like, it's like, cause you're not perfect that you got it the first time. Like to me, it's almost like reverse now. Well, I mean, I, and I, I want to, I want to say this carefully. <laughs> just say it. <laughs> yeah, just no, no, say because, it. no, because I want to just, I want to just be careful not to sound conceited or anything, but when you reach a certain point of technical skill that we all have, it's like being a mechanic working on a car. It becomes like second you, nature. You know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might not, I mean, some mechanics know how to, do their, how to do their job better than others. That's why, you know, you can go to the mechanic once and they, they fix everything or they find all the trouble spots and they, they you go on about your business and other cars keep coming back because it's just not done properly, right? But if, you're, if you know what you're doing, if you're hitting all of the things with creating an illustration or any kind of piece of art and you're confident and you just do it, um, it does become second nature. You're not thinking about it. Like you're just, you're watching Netflix while you're painting a face. It doesn't matter. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like it's just effortless, but it does become a second nature, like auto mechanic kind of kind of thing where you just go in and go, oh, well, I need to do this, this, and this today in order to, you know, hit my deadline of whatever else. But I don't know. And you're not stressing it. It's just yeah. work. But if it's work then obviously you want to benefit from that but if it's not work if it's your if you're making a personal piece that's just for you i think that it's okay to challenge yourself and it's okay to struggle with certain pieces of it that are not as second hand like second nature to you or like you know because there's certain things that i can do that don't require a second thought like i can render a pretty good rose like now after doing that effing piece you know very very quickly but if I was asked, or if I wanted to challenge myself by drawing somebody inside of a mech, that's going to take me some effort. What would impress me about actually finishing that piece is the fact that I struggled through it and finished it in any way, because that blows my mind every time I see it. Um, there's some, like, it's this cool trend now of um, people will do those time-lapse illustrations, you know, like on Procreate, and you'll see like, doo -doo 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 -doo, and everything, you know, gets done. And usually it looks so perfect and so smooth. But now sometimes I see people who are like really exploring the drawing that they're doing and they have like the head at like this angle, this angle, this thing. And they're like drawing it and erasing it or just like drawing right over it. And like, they're just like trying to figure out what one, which one looks best. And it takes them a lot of tries to do it, but then they land on it and then they go through and finish it. And I'm like, I can identify the very point where I would have been like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> like, I was like, they powered through that ugly phase. Like it looks so ugly. And then they power through it and it looks amazing. Yeah. And I'm just like, they, that, that's some, that's willpower right there. That's amazing to me because they challenged themselves with a weird angle and they accomplished it, but it took them some tries. And I like seeing that just as much as I like seeing the perfect looking stuff too. Those, I, I, I have the complete opposite feeling when I watch those videos. <laughs> really? I just, it's like, I, I, I talk about it with my students. It's kind of like, you have no direction for the piece. There was no idea. It's just, you said, okay, I'm going to draw some cyberpunk cityscape with a person doing something. It's kind of like just saying, I'm going to get in the car and drive that way. Like there's no plan. And then when you see all those, mm -hmm. let me just flip this character, change this head, flip the entire composition 
and sh put a building over here for no reason at all. Like you just go, oh my God. But then when you look at the final piece, you go, damn, that looks dope. <laughs> but they had no idea where they were going until like the last half hour of that thing. You go, okay, well, here's where they kind of got an idea of what they wanted to do. I can't, that's fine art to me. That's not, I don't know. I think everyone just has a different process though. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's, I think that's yeah, okay. That's their... I, think, I think you're thinking in the context of like, I have to do things for a job. I have to do things with a deadline in order to make money. But yeah. these, these personal pieces are just for practice. They're just for funsies. So I think that's totally okay to have no idea where you're, because like, honestly, nine times out of 10 in my sketchbook, I'll just start drawing yeah. something. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know where I'm going, but sometimes I have surprising results at the end of it. And I'm like, oh, I didn't expect that, but that's okay. If I had planned it, it would have been completely different. So yeah. it's like, you know, I like to have a direction when I'm doing things for work because I need to have a, I need to constrain myself so that I can deliver. But yeah. for myself, for me, um, if I know that it's going to be a part of a series, like a big illustration, yes, I want a direction, but in my sketchbook or, or just if I'm playing around, like, I don't know what, what I'm going to do or what I'm going to make of it. Like the piece that I did of, um, this model, Yanju Stevens, um, I was just, I just wanted to draw her. That's all I really wanted to do. And then, and she had a big Afro and she looked awesome. And I was, and as I was drawing it, I was like, oh, but what if she was a tiefling? That would be fun. And I just like added horns and stuff. That piece blew up on Twitter no idea that would have happened and that would have that wouldn't have happened if i had a plan because like my plan was just to draw her but it, then it evolved and as i was creating it and so that there is the opposite of perfection that was just me experimenting and playing and it became something organic that i didn't expect it to become and i think that's yeah. beautiful that's like that's just like the creative process right there at play yeah, you know? no, you're absolutely right. I've, 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 I have sketches and, and personal pieces where I am just up late at night, just scribbling. And then, yeah. you know, it evolves into something and you go, all right, that's, that's, that, that's cool. I mean, I have those, I have a ton of those. Mm -hmm. I just don't have YouTube videos chronicling it. <laughs> right. And I guess I'm a little jealous <laughs> that somebody had the, the the forethought to just press record while that happened and they came out with something cool and i'm just like i don't i don't understand what i'm watching but it looks cool so I just but think about it in yeah the <laughs> yeah i feel like I, I feel like just hearing about this too it's like i think that i'm definitely not at that point where it feels effortless i feel like sometimes like every piece has its own process which is really confusing and and i feel like i'm doing it wrong for that reason like where it just sort of feels like well if i knew what i was doing every piece would have a predictable process and a predictable result but there was some artists that i forget i forget who and i'm sorry like that i can't remember but they were saying every every uh, painting you make is a different problem that you solve. So it's not necessarily gonna be the same process. Sometimes it could be, but sometimes it's just not. Like you wouldn't do a line drawing to paint a sunset because that's more about color and value and lighting and stuff. Whereas you would do a line drawing for something very technical like a, a, a building or something, you know? And so th that's just one loose example of how two different problems are solved differently. But um, I, I definitely agree that for, you know, deadlines, especially tight deadlines, you should have a plan, you should have at least some kind of or try to develop some kind of process that is dependable so that you know you can hit those results in that time frame. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I guess it's like, I'm not trying to say that people should struggle in every single piece they do, but I like the honesty. I like, I think it's like this age of perfection where we just see everyone's perfect Instagram and Facebook posts, you know, that I'm trying to, yeah somewhat rail against where I'm just like, no, but tell me when it's not a perfect day when the sun's hitting you at the right light, you know? It's like, <laughs> tell me about that day where you're just like, I didn't want to create today, but I'm still an artist. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I don't know. I think I'm just, it's a combination between like how I grew up thinking about what the ideal artist is like, someone who always draws in a sketchbook, who every day wants to draw, who every day has an idea, you know? It's like, and and there's so many different kinds of artists and it doesn't all have to look the same, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the imperfection is when you see it in, in play and concert, it's, it's comforting because n like none of us have like had every single day be a perfect day when we're trying to create art. None of us have had that. And so seeing other people's imperfect day, but it still turned out to be what we think is a perfect piece like that's really comforting because we know that it just wasn't it wasn't automatic all the time 
Um, and sometimes it is like there's some people who, you know, they have they get to solve the same problem every time where it's not a problem anymore, where they they have a formula and they always stick to it and it's fine and that works for them. And that's really profitable. And that's awesome when people can do that. But I think personally, I would get bored after a while of trying to solve the same problem. I would want to challenge myself. And the struggle of challenging yourself can be daunting when you think that you're the only one struggling. But then you go and see people also trying to solve a new problem and they're struggling through it and they solved it. You're like, it makes it feel like it's a, a little bit more attainable for you too. You're like, oh, okay. Like, it's okay to struggle sometimes. You're like, I probably, if I stick to this, I can probably get there in the end too. And like, you know, for professional artists who have been doing this for, you know, 20, 30 years, like maybe that, maybe they might look down on that or maybe they might see that as like a weakness. But I think that it's something that benefits people who, you know, who do struggle a little bit more um, than those veterans do. And I think that's okay. Cause like what matters at the end of the day is that you're, I mean, you're, you're creating something, you're putting something out there. So if you let those struggles and that perfectionism stop you from putting pieces into the world, then your perfectionism has become a burden and not a, not, not an asset. So mm -hmm. it's about how to like, you know, make those imperfections shine and make, you know, make your process come to light uh, no matter what and actually get those pieces out there. So that's what ultimately at the end of the day I want to see is that, you know, art was made. <laughs> no matter how it was made, it was made. And I think that's, you know, I think that's lovely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But the excellence piece of it too is like, what does that look like? I mean, that's going to look different for each person as well. Like, how can we get to the excellence while bypassing uh, the need for ultimate perfectionism or the, the need to idealize everything? Like, what does the excellence look like for you, Mia? I think it's just about acknowledging that every time, I, I mean, I already do it. Like with everything I do, I put hundred percent, 110 percent, you know, and it's like, and, and that just means that it's like, I, I want to get better. I want my work to be the best it can possibly be. I want to pour my love into something. That's actually what I consider excellence. And, and not just my art, actually. Like, even when I was waiting tables and stuff, I mean, I was, like, employee of the month <laughs> at, like, one of my uh, jobs. And it's, like, you would say that it's, like, oh, I can't wait to get home and paint. And I felt that way. But I also was, like, if I'm going to be here spending 40 hours a week of my life here, I want to do the best damn job I can do, you know, and like get something out of this. And I did. And I think that it's just, I don't know, I guess I just, I take pride in my work and I try to put love in everything I do. And that's kind of what I see excellence as. And I should just be satisfied with that. And I feel like the minute it starts crossing over to perfectionism is like this expectation that's unhealthy and, unto and toxic. Whereas just keeping a focus on excellence is just being proud of the work you do you know, and just going like, hey, even though today my 110% wasn't as good as yesterday, let's say tomorrow, it can be better or the day after or whatever. It's not about, it's not about having a really strict regimen. It's just about taking pride in the work you do when you do it and, and being easy on yourself as well, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Eric, what is your excellence? Um, well, my, my idea of of excellence in regard to my work is um, really making sure before a piece leaves my studio or before I send it off to a client that I feel it is A, tops what I might have done before it and B, is on par with the work that I see out there from some of my art heroes or people that I admire. Um, it's, it's like an internal competition in my head. Like I, like I need, I need it to be better than the last piece and I need it to be as strong as what I see out there. Otherwise I think I feel like I've, I've failed or, hmm. you know, and it's in it, that, that, that competition part, uh, goes back to the um, doing the best you can within a time frame, mm -hmm. trying to paint faster, do more, think about all of the problems, all of the issues, all of the things that could go wrong in a piece and make those corrections on the fly in, you know, fast and have that feeling that you created, you know, quality. Um, I don't know but that's, that's just what goes on in my head constantly. So um, 
when I, when I put it out there in the world, I know I'm not showing something that I'm, I'm embarrassed of. Maybe, and nobody else would even care. They might be like, wow, that's amazing. But if I'm like, eh, that hand is a little off. <laughs> but like you, you, you know, you, you know that you're the, those pieces where you're, you're like, no, it's off. I know it's off, but everybody else doesn't seem to care or notice, but you notice. But if you can put a piece out there that you know, you nailed it, you know, a hundred percent. I don't know. That's, that's just me. Yeah. Is that little, that's a little too much pressure. <laughs> no, you're yeah. I don't I mean, know. That's, yeah, that's what it means to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like it's weird for me um, because recently I feel like I've gotten to a place where I'm like, okay, like, I think that I know really what I want to create and the kind of work that I want to make. But my idea of excellence is actually being able to sit down and do it. And, but like, but not just do it, but feel mentally well enough to do it and feel inspired while doing it. Mm -hmm. um, because like being burnt out over these past, I don't know what, five years um, has been, it's been a struggle to create. Mm -hmm. And I know that like, like the energy is there somewhere in here and like the burnout is just keeping it muted and getting to a point where I can actually start consistently creating things that I'm, you know, that I enjoy that they don't even have to be perfect. I just want to make them. Um, excellence to me is just being able to express what I want to express without feeling like it's a, like a lot of a struggle. Like I want to be able to feel good about my, about creating again, not even my art, but just creating. Um, and I think once I can get there, I can really like start to hone in on, you know, like what perfection looks like or like what, you know, my next level looks like. Mm -hmm. But I haven't even been able to get there just because I've been so tired. Um, you know, like working full time is just like a different, it's different. I don't get to create, you know, during my day to day uh, for, the eight, for the eight hour plus hours that I work every day. Um, I'm in meetings, I'm managing, you know, I'm, I'm looking after other things. I'm looking after another product, but my own work has been on hold and I would like it very much to be off hold and, um, and to be able to create my own story again. But then once I get there, I can start really like looking at topping myself and like, um, you know, like increasing that level of better and better and seeing what that next phase is. Yeah. That's where I would what? like to be. What has the change in your life in order for you to achieve that goal though? I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to give up stuff. Oh, oh no. What, whatever shall I do? Giving up things. <laughs> How can I do that? <laughs> yeah, can you know, part-time or, or. Is oh that God, no, I can't work part-time. No, it's, it's not like I do have to give up stuff. Uh, it's, it's freelance. I have to give up freelance. I have to stop doing that anymore. <laughs> Stop. We've talked <laughs> about this. We've talked about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, fortunately, the the projects that I'm getting now are one offs. Um, but for, I mean, for the last two years, I've been dealing with a long term project that's like been over my head, and that's finally starting to resolve itself. Um, but yeah, I have to be very adamant about that <laughs> and get to a place where I don't have so much extra on my plate that I can't sit down and like feel good about creating. So I'm forcing myself now to actually relax and I'm going on vacation. I'm going to relax and I'm not going to, I'm not going to create forcibly while I'm still working this week. And we'll see how I, we'll see where I get to after these two weeks. But um, a sabbatical sounds really nice though. That I love a sabbatical. Yeah, there you go. It'd be super dope. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's where I would, would want to get to. But, but speaking of the full-time, um, aspects of things like being a manager it's something that I have to think about a lot too um perfectionism in particular and knowing when to stop or you're, you're like stop honing something um because it's a different ball game when you're creating for a product or if you work in animation or in games uh you really have to know when to let go <laughs> you really have to know when to let go and you have to know what's like what people are going to actually experience and look at and what is what needs to fall to the back burner uh it's something that i have to work with a lot of like younger reports with um because like they want to focus on like this little detail on a piece that is going to be seen on a tiny screen 
probably for one second. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I know that you want this hand to look perfect. However, no one's going to notice. <laughs> I barely noticed it. I think it's fine. And I think I realized this when um, I was working uh, back at Floyd, my old studio. Uh, I was working on a show and we spent weeks on this one scene, weeks on it, like to make it beautiful. And the lighting was hitting the rocks perfectly and the colors were great and amazing. And we painted it and like, you know, I, it took a lot of time like doing like the sketches for it and making sure that the feedback was on point. And then we sit and we watch the show together and that scene was not in the show. It was oh. not there, it was cut. Oh <laughs> We no. didn't know that. <laughs> God. <laughs> that's that's a punch in the face yeah i mean it was par for the course unfortunately i mean yeah. there was some there was a there was a show that we worked maybe nine months on that never saw the light of day and so after that i was like you know what like you can fight this battle i want things to be like look really good but it's defining what that good really looks like or like focusing your energy on the places that are going to garner the attention where do you want the viewer's eye to go? If they're not, if the viewer's eye is not going over here, then we're not focusing on over here. We're going to focus on the main feature of this thing. Because if you try to put all of your even attention on every single part of a piece when you're working on a game or, or a TV show, it's you're, you're going to just spend a bunch of time making a mess is really what it is. Like you're not focusing on what the players or the viewer is going to be focusing on. You're, you're putting your attention to the wrong things. And yeah. so perfectionism can really, really bite you when you're working in a professional environment. So I've really had to learn how to let things go and how to be like, or how to be like, I wouldn't have done it like this, but this is still fine. Yeah. Because like, if it's, if it's giving, if it's getting the point across, then that's what matters more so than my own personal vision. Like your personal vision has to take a back seat oh, yeah. when you're working in a studio. And that's a hard thing to compromise with at first. But once you get used to it, you're just like, okay, like, and you don't take anything personally. You don't think that you don't take things to heart. It doesn't hurt your soul as much as it used to. Which is why I stay home and not work in a studio. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't work in a studio, but I still need to learn this lesson, Lauren. I mean, doing an illustrated book, I mean, it's like you do need to, it's working smarter, not harder. And I think yeah. that that's part of it too, that it's like, I, I'm realizing more the older I get that it's like, it's about the performance. And what I mean by that is like, can you get the job done? Can you, can you communicate the idea? Like, mm -hmm. and, and what's the, what's the smartest way to do that with the time you have? It's yeah. not about like, I have to show everyone every single skill I have in this one painting. And then in times a hundred, you know, it's like, no, what is the smartest way you can get this job done? That's excellence, you know, because yeah. it takes skill to do that. And it takes a lot of, you know, dumbing down the ego to do that and not everyone can do that <laughs> not everyone can do that and some people make a living off of not doing that on purpose but then other many other people also make a living on knowing where to cut you know like not cut corners but like cut the small stuff yeah. and focus on the big picture and make that big picture look really really good yeah. I mean there's plenty of renaissance paintings that have just like a blob as a figure in the background but that blob doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> because well, my... you're looking at the beautifully rendered face of the main character Mm -hmm. My new favorite thing is, can this piece use more atmospheric haze so I don't have to, <laughs> yeah, I don't have to paint feet or random people? Like, yes, yes, it does. Poof. Because like, it's kind of, it's kind of like looking at a, a Sargent painting. I, I compare, I, I show that, I show his work a lot and um how beautifully he'll render a character in the foreground and then how quickly like like an afterthought and as far as his brush strokes are to for uh background elements mm -hmm. pottery people wall textures it's just you know it's just there it's just dressing because yeah. it's not it's not the focal point yeah. and but then there's other people like uh jerome who go in there and render the crap out of everything yeah you know every <laughs> but uh no atmospheric haze no mist nothing like yeah that one's not necessarily better they're both great you know right they're both great it's just like you know could could yeah. could it's just you know it's just a different way of approaching it but uh you know 
I don't know. And your personal skill sets and your temperament, all those things come into play in terms of the decisions you make. Like maybe Jerome was a crazy fast painter and he had really lax deadlines. Like that might have dictated why he got to do that kind of detail. I'm just speculating. I don't actually know. But that that's not something you could hold against someone who had less time, who maybe had less of an attention span, but still got a kick-ass painting done in a different style. Like, you know, and it's like, I think that when we try to measure everyone based on the same metrics, that's where, and this is, you know, something we talked about on the ADHD episode as well, that it's like, I think we're coming from this world where everyone got judged by one specific agreed upon set of, you know, rules of excellence, rules of performance and things like that and success. And I hope we're evolving into a more, you know, empathetic and understanding time where we see that, hey, everyone is really different actually. And the result is important, like how how good it is, but we don't judge it all by the same very restrictive, you know, manner. I don't even know if that's put across the right way, but. No, absolutely. Like everybody has like, everybody has their own definition of excellence and somebody else's excellence doesn't have to apply to my excellence or your excellence or Eric's excellence. Like it all looks different because we're all unique in the way we create. Like whether that struggle um, of going through those 10 different heads is what gets you the best result or having a plan before you go in, gets you the best result. Like that's what works for you. So everybody has their own way of working and, th and those things are valid. Again, as long as you're creating art and you're happy with what you've created, like that's what ultimately what matters. Like, and if you want to continue to build upon yourself and, and make it better and better, then do that to your own standard. But you can't do that from anybody else's prescription, but your own. And, you know, and that's okay. Like, obviously there's certain standards that you should adhere to. Like, obviously do your studies and like, make sure that you're, you know, always visiting your foundations. Of course, that's only going to make you better. But in terms of your creative process, however you get there is how you get there. Yeah. And it looks like it's different for everybody. And I think that people really do hold themselves to a high standard that looks like a specific picture because that's what's been marketed to us mm -hmm. growing up. But now we're realizing that that doesn't have to be that way and it's changing. And, um, and like you said, Mia, like I think it is more empathetic nowadays. And like, we've gotten to a point where we're starting to understand each other a lot better and we're starting to see behind that curtain and knowing that we're not alone in when we have a bad day or when we have a, even a good day or like what we get inspired by. Like it's all unique, but it's all like, I don't know, it's, all, it's uplifting to know that so many people can create in so many different ways. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I got to say about that. <laughs> I'm curious to know from people watching what your perfectionism looked like and what your excellence looks like. And uh, put it in the comments if you're watching this video um, below, because I would love to see it and see what your idea of it is. All right. So thank you all for joining us uh, for this episode. Uh, if you like this episode and want to see more, uh, you can go back into our back catalog and see a bunch of different episodes. Smash that like and subscribe button, uh, <laughs> like all the kids say on YouTube. Um, but yeah, that's what I got for you. Um, use the force, Harry. I don't know. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any beautifully put uh, ending for us today. But um, I love it. <laughs> I will <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. All right. And cut. <laughs> <laughs>